Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining the What If Seminar series today. Um, as you see, we have Stephen Ritmore as our guest speaker today. And John will tell you a little bit more about him in just a moment. Um, just to let you know, this webinar is going to be recorded and sent to all those who registered for the seminar today. Um, and if you guys have any questions during this presentation, please direct those to the Q&A box. We will do our best to answer those questions throughout the presentation. The webinar is also going to be one hour long, starting from now till 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then after the seminar, we will email you a brief survey so you can share your feedback about your experience. But we appreciate you joining, signing up, and attending the IF Centers for Seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Diamond. Welcome, everyone. So I think we have uh, uh, representatives from uh, the College of Public Health, uh, faculty, staff, and students in the larger University of Kentucky community, and people from the TCOM uh, collaborative world, including some of our colleagues uh, internationally. So welcome all. This is our inaugural IF Center seminar series. The uh, IF Center is the Center for Innovation and in Population Health, which is a university-based center based in the College of Public Health. And since our mandate is innovation, you know, to be an innovator, you need to be heterodox in your thinking. So you need to be able to break away from traditional or orthodox ways of thinking about things to think about your challenges differently. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to look across other fields that may be completely unrelated to our work and look how those fields try to conquer challenges that are similar but different from ours. So that's the spirit of this uh, seminar series. We look to uh, pull together people from across all the colleges of the University of Kentucky to offer different perspectives on similar challenges so that we can help people become heterodox in their thinking. So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Stephen Rentmore. Um, so I'll tell you that you know, a lot of folks at the IF Center have already heard Steve, Stephen speak once. We've gotten our first dose, and we're looking forward to this talk, sort of like we're looking forward to the second dose of the COVID vaccine with great anticipation about what it can lead in terms of how we, <laughs> what we are able to do and think. Anyway, so uh, Stephen is a, an award-winning British theater director, dramaturg, producer, writer, academic curator, change consultant. He is a uh, he studied at the other universities. So I'm not talking about the University of Louisville, I'm talking about Cambridge. So uh, that's where he got his, his uh, studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, and he has worked all over the world uh, in, from Siberia to San Francisco to the Royal Theater in London. And if you wanna have a side conversation about his experiences in Siberia, I think you'll find that by itself interesting. So anyway, without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Stephen Rentmore from the uh, College of Fine Arts. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and there's lots that I want to talk about. Uh, and some of the things have, I think, a direct relationship to the things that you are exploring, but rather than patronize you and try and guess at what your world is and the things that may or may not be useful, what I thought I'd do is run back through a process of storytelling from a non-medical background. So whilst I'm looking at how some of these things might connect for you, and particularly in terms of approaching grant and research papers, I'm going to do so in a context of how we tell stories about everything we do. So whether you're looking to create a framework for a health journey, a research paper or a grant, this is designed to introduce you to dramatic structure and how that allows you to tell a story. Marvelous. So to be clear, um, this is just my distillation of multiple definitions. The term dramaturgy seems to originate from Germany somewhere around the 18th century, but I'm not intending this to be a history lesson or a theater class. So I'm going to avoid as much as I can about going into those details. Interestingly, the Wikipedia tells me that dramaturgy is the study of dramatic construction. And I agree, but I've added an addendum um, because I also want you to consider that dramaturgy is active. It includes the now, and the context. And so whenever we're talking about dramaturgy, what we're thinking about is something that is alive rather than something that is more akin to museum study. Uh, 
also for me, drama Turkey is a champion of the text or the narrative. Uh, it's not what you want it to be, it is what it is. What you want it to be might be editing. And this is so much more about the extractor of the overt and the covert narrative. And dramaturgy is how you tell the evolving story. So I'll go into more detail about this uh, a little bit later on, but it applies in multiple different ways. And the prompt I had was how we tell it in story terms. So if we agree that the starting point is our given circumstances, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what these words mean in a minute, a minute, and the destination is the resolution, it's the end point, the space in between is the unknown. So crudely, for example, if the given circumstances are unwellness, and then the resolution is wellness, then the dramaturgy unpacks the story between those two points. Secondly, the start point includes intention, and the end point includes the resolution of that intention. Put simply, for example, point one might be, I need milk for my coffee, and I don't have any, and the resolution might be, I have milk or I've decided to reduce my lactose intake, I don't need milk anymore. The space in between included, includes the choice to journey to the store, the travel, the shopping, the return, the brewing, the coffee, and ultimately the drinking, the resolution. The point that I want to get to is that in a play or in a film or something that's written with the structure, the journey between the given circumstances, the place we find ourselves, and the resolution is a construct. And I'm hoping that through the process that we go through today, you'll see that we can build models for this construct in the space where we don't have the narrative. Marvelous. The dramaturgy is a partner in the process. It's a guide, but you still drive it. It releases the story or the stories from all the other stuff. It realizes the vision, the ambition, and the outcome. They're a guide and a truth teller. It keeps you true to the original story. And this is what I'm trying to explore today. It also becomes a critical friend so that, for example, when you're writing a grant application or you're writing a paper, one of the things that dramaturgy does is work as a critical friend with you. It keeps you on a pathway towards your destination rather than uh, helps you get bogged down in moments of detail. Marvelous. And what's it's got to me, got to do with me, was my original thought when uh, the department asked me to contribute to this. Uh, and it occurred to me that within the theatrical context, but also in life, we're the stars of our own tragedy. And I also love the idea that now that I have earbuds, uh, my uh, life story also has a soundtrack. But I'm going to introduce you metaphorically to ways of exploring health outcomes and personifying the process and humanizing the experience. I also want to show you that the process of building, for example, a grant or research proposal contains, regardless of its content, at its heart, a story. And we all know stories because we learn them from a really early age. They begin with once upon a time. The stories for research grants are also therefore about unthreading the mass of information and clearing out the clutter into a series of articulated steps towards your destination. I also want to include the idea that there's a sense that the arts are less structured or empirical than science, but my argument is that the arts also have processes that are repeatable and the outcomes are not luck. It includes the skill, it includes experience, but it also includes a set of systems that followed allow you to get to an outcome that is uh, in whatever way we determine success. For me, I, this quote that I was thinking about, it's unthreading the story from the mass of information. It's what you know, what you want to tell us and what we need to know. Uh, it's also it comes back to the idea that stories are pretty basic in their, um, in, in their origins, the idea that there are a limited number of props. We've got like, uh, sorry, prompts, plots. We have the David and Goliath. Uh, we have Cinderella. We have the quest, like Tomb Raider. We have the voyage and return, like the Hobbit. Uh, all of these in and of themselves are the baseline out of which you construct the narrative that you want to use. And the tools that you use are the thing that make it original, make it exciting and make it engaging. The tools include language, they include nuance, they include metaphor, and they include theme. At its heart though, is a consideration of the audience because it doesn't matter how clever you are and how complex your argument, if the audience can't see it and respond to it, they don't go on the journey. And so part of my thesis for today is the idea that dramaturgy is about releasing the story specifically, and this is the active bit, it releases the story for the audience to hear. I'm gonna introduce you to a student called Hamlet from a writer called William. 
because one of the easiest ways of giving you an example of how dramaturgy and structure might work is taking an existing narrative and deconstructing it for you to use it as a context for our wider conversation. I'm hoping that through this you can see a degree of metaphor. But I also want to assure you that this isn't a theatre class and it is not long enough to go into a scholarly overview of Hamlet. But to build my theme, I'm going to introduce you to the context of the play as an action of the play. And this isn't to assume your expertise in Hamlet, but rather to give everyone an overview and the same starting point to our conversation. It'll also introduce you, I hope, to a shared language that you might find helpful. So here we go. The story puts Hamlet in the middle. So within the dramaturgy, what you have is the central protagonist or the narrative that you want to tell the story about. And around that narrative, you have the other significant people who are involved. In the world of Hamlet, it includes Claudius, the actors who I'll go into a little bit more detail later. We've got Hamlet's family. We've got the university where he's a student. The people, Hamlet is the Prince of Denmark. We've got Polonius who for shorthand is the prime minister. It includes his daughter whom Hamlet is in love with and she in love with him. And it includes Laertes who will ultimately kill Hamlet. And it includes Hamlet's friend Horatio who is there as a confidant throughout. We also have the outside world or politics in this case. You can also make that slightly more complicated if you want to create nuance by changing the depth and size of the circles, depending on your perception of how important they are to the central character. Uh, and then this first word that we've come across is plot. And this is the unfolding event, events and what actually happens. It happens to be reflective in hindsight or after the event. So we can see the entirety of a plot because we can read the entirety of the play. In a health journey, we might make predictions. So if we're in the middle of the process, we can make educated es estimations. In our grant and proposal writing, we might consider the whole process of the document, the plot. Also, I just want to unpack the idea of the key elements of Hamlet into two slides. So uh, Hamlet is a play that in performance is about four and a half hours long. So it seems ridiculous to think that you can compress and condense everything that happens in the story into two slides. But I also want to go back to the idea that a maxim is, what does your audience need to know? And when you're writing or considering the story that you need to tell, one of the things you're engaging with is how I get the key elements across, creating space for a conversation afterwards that will allow me to show more depth, rather than showing all the depth at the beginning and allowing the audience no pathway through all the complexity that you then create. It's also about working in a process of editing so that what you're doing is paring back the information you have to reveal core elemental truths that become the building blocks for your story. So these are the significant moments in Hamlet's story. It's debatable, there are others, but I picked out some. And what I've also done is support each action point with a quote. I know this because of this, so that within my process, when I make a statement, I'm looking for a way of evidencing it. So I won't read all this to you because that would be patronizing, but I'll start with Hamlet returns from university for the funeral of his father and the remarriage of his mother. And we know this happens very quickly because Hamlet says the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. So this idea that in poetry we get the sense of pressure on Hamlet and the idea that how could his mother marry his uncle so quickly after the death of his father? We have this tension. And then going through, we have revenge this foul and most unnatural murder and get thee to a nunnery and to be or not to be, where we ha have this first insight that Hamlet is unwell, where he's pushing away his friends, pushing away his girlfriend, and he's considering whether being alive or not being alive is a worthy solution to his predicament, which leads into a state of emotional turmoil. And he says, I'm mad, but north, northwest. This leads to the arrival of the actors. And I love them as a metaphor, and I also love them as an idea, because the world of Hamlet is enclosed within a, the castle of Elsinore. It's a closed system. And it takes the arrival of the outside agency, the agency of change, in this case, the actors, to come and tell a story and show a different way of viewing it. And then we have the unfolding sense that Claudius has become suspicious. My offense is rank, it smells to heaven. Then. Hamlet, who has been planning murder all the way along, achieves his ambition, but murders the wrong person, thus damning his soul to hell. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this. 
and Hamlet is sent to England. The expectation is he will die there, but he escapes death and is philosophical and embracing of that death. Ophelia, in the meantime, is driven mad by grief. A man's life is no more than to say one, says Hamlet. And I just want to step out for a moment because uh, Ophelia's suicide is contested uh, because it happens off stage. But I also want to observe that if we're going to look at Ophelia's death rather than Hamlet's death, it is inextricably linked to the life of Hamlet and also takes into account, because we must include the fact that she's a victim of a patriarchy and a toxic masculinity in which she feels completely trapped and from which her solution is her own death. Hamlet has a different approach, but similarly arrives at death which is the final battle. And this is where the loop continues. Horatio, the confidant from the beginning of the story, is told to tell his story. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. Flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Marvelous. So here's the stop moment. This is the context moment. And I want to get to the idea of what would have to happen for the story to end differently. This is where a dramaturgy uh, steps in and perhaps we can talk a little bit in the realm of public health. And this is where we can use fiction to consider fact. And this is where the story becomes human or humane. The point about the play on an education level is to show us the moments of shift where something else was possible. When we are considering a real story, the future isn't written, but we can see the outcome. So uh, a couple of days ago, I was watching the news and I was watching cars sliding down a hill in Texas on the snow, drifting gently out of control. They haven't hit anything yet, but they're not in control. And so we can see the story unfolding before us. We know the outcome, even while the thing is happening in front of us. And for me, the metaphor of that is going on within the world of Hamlet. And so the question comes back, what would we have to do? When would we intervene to make sure that at the end of Hamlet, nobody died? What would we have to do for Hamlet to stop this happening? What would we have to do for Ophelia to stop this happening? Where is our intervention? The tools are, first of all, storyboarding, that we lay out the story and where we haven't completed the story, we have blank spaces and I'll come to this later. The second is Mr. Rumfeld and he talked about known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. But within this world, I think it's brilliant to consider the idea that there are things that are going on that we don't know about. And we know that they're there, but we haven't worked out what they are yet. But we also know that there are things that are predictable, likely and possible. So in a play called Hamlet, we're going to see, a lot, see and spend a lot of time with a character called Hamlet. And in a health journey, we're going to spend a lot of time with a patient called Hamlet. So what I was questioning and what I'm curious about is, is it therefore possible to map out and predict known outcomes from previous experiences? Is it possible, for example, uh, to take the experience of another person who is in a similar situation and look where that person's journey went and then overlay it onto the person who hasn't yet lived that story? In the space that we don't know, we have in maths, X. In theatre, we call it the, the what if. What if this happened? And what if this happened? And each moment, therefore, contains the possibility of another path. Because in the story of uh, theatre, the end is always written. And what we do as the audience is experience the unfolding of that story. In a tragedy, we know, because the form demands it, that the outcome is death. Therefore, the process leads in incremental moments towards that death. That is the reveal. The interesting part of the drama, therefore, is to follow how that happens and observe the moments where another path was possible. Macbeth says, I am in blood, stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as to go forward or to go o'er, if I'm going to give you the direct Shakespeare. But I want to spotlight that every one of these moments contains a myriad of other possibilities. Each step isn't predictable in our lives, but some things have a regularity about it. And what storyboarding will do is allow you a space to go, these are things that we could predict to happen. So if we go back to the cars uh, drifting down the hill in Texas, it was predictable at the top of the hill that those cars would hit the ice and snow. And at some point the driver may lose control. There are other known unknowns. There could be curveballs that come into the situation that might be unlikely, but still allow the possibility of us telling the story. So what we can do, and I'll get to this 
uh, at the end of this presentation is create pathways that allow us to look at a probable outcome and then possible other outcomes and make space for outliers. I want to connect this to an anecdote about getting thin. Uh, so when someone, anyone, but let's call it me, uh, starts their diet, the starting point has an intention. And the first two weeks are great. I go to the gym, I'm feeling excited, I'm working out, and I like being in the gym, even though I kind of hate gyms, and I'm listening to new soundtracks, and it's fun building my soundtracks, and I see progress, and I change my eating behaviors, and I feel a little bit better about all these things, and two weeks later, I've lost some weight, and I feel good. And then the next week, my progress kind of slows, and I've lost a little bit less weight, and going to the gym isn't quite as fun as it used to be, and that's the moment where it would be easy to quit. It's also the moment where all of the rewards start to diminish and now it starts to take on a psychological need for my determination to get going and move forward. Now, if we were to plan an intervention in a storyboarding setting, then our first point of contact, having established the idea that I'm going to the gym, is in two weeks to check just before things go off the rail that everything's okay. That there's a moment here where a motivational conversation or a reminder that it's a process, it's not a destination, would be helpful to help me get through the next two weeks and the next two weeks and the next two weeks. So the storyboarding is about reminding the participant that there's a destination, but the storyboarding is also helping the outside agency, the actors in the world of Hamlet, to plan their moments of intervention so that they can be useful so that the person doesn't slip off and fall into other behaviors, historic behaviors, known behaviors, because we've seen it happen before in other people. Hamlet's great question is to be or not to be. And he's talking about living or dying, but we could also look at it in terms of to tell or not to tell, to do something or not to do something. Sometimes choosing not to do something is also active. So when you're telling your story and you know all about ABC, you're an expert in ABC, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need all to be represented in your work, in your writing, in your presentation. Rather, you could choose C as, its mo as your most potent element and allude to A and let B go. And if you asked, if you're asked for more detail, then your B can be reintroduced. For example, if you're interesting, it is interesting to me uh, to know that Hamlet is a student of Wittenberg because it gives context to his relationship with the ghost of his father. He's a student of divinity and therefore his relationship with the idea of good and evil and the devil sent to temptation becomes significant to his plot journey. It's also fascinating to me that Denmark, when the play was written, had the most powerful canon in Europe which made it tax rich because no ship could pass between the straits of Denmark and Norway without making payment. But these are contextual. Knowing it helps, it's entertaining, but perhaps they don't help the reader engage in the story of Hamlet. And that's my provocation in this. The second thing is to go into the idea of what the characters say about themselves or the patient or the material that you have. So Hamlet tells us, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, God, how weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. So we know that his state of mind is challenged. We know that he needs help. He's telling us that he's in a difficult predicament. How do we get close? Well, Ophelia is close to him, but this is what she says about him. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. And I, of ladies most dejected and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, to have seen what I've seen, see what I see. Again, we can see that she too is journeying on the, in a direction that is not healthy for her. And so we have this evidence thing that we can start to plan and plot and include within our journey of storyboard. So what do we think? So my challenge is, there we have a number of different pieces of information, a number of different facts that inform or create the thesis for our journey ahead. If we didn't know how the play finished, if the play has yet to be written, we now have a series of pieces of information that we can use as evidence to build or predict or create the storyboard of what might happen next. And that, if you like, is where I wanted to start. The next thing is that Hamlet being a fiction is designed to tell a story and it happens within a framework. And we know real life isn't like that, right? But what I want to do is get to the idea that within all of our lives, there are predictable and repeatable behaviors that give us and allow us as outsiders to a story, the ability to build a framework for it. And it's that structure that allows us to be 
for choice of the word scientific. So it works like this. The stories have a structure. So uh, back in ancient Greece, um, in a book called Poetics, Aristotle created a framework that we still use today. There are, of course, alternative models, including the ubiquitous postmodern approach, but this will serve as context for the next part of the narrative. Uh, what I want to do is get the idea that in drama, what we're doing is working on building and hooking the audience. So it's constantly escalating. I also want to suggest to you that if we're dealing with a health outcome, our ambition is to make sure this doesn't become an increasing line, but rather it either declines or goes straight, or even more ideally, we leap towards the end. Let me show you in a different context. This is the one hour TV drama concept. Uh, and you can also see that it was built in 15 minute sections because back in the day, there used to be commercial breaks. But what I suggest to you is if you're watching your streamed experience on television, every 10 minutes or so, you will see in the writing a hook that pulls us to the next section, a hook that allows us to re-engage our curiosity, that drives us forward. And so we have our inciting incident, the thing that happens that makes everything else happen. Because of this, this next thing occurs, which then creates the complication, which leads to a crisis, which leads to a climax, which results in everything being um, resolved. Let me give you an example of an inciting incident. So in John Wick, we have this small text. I heard you struck my son. Yes, I did, sir. And may I ask why? Yeah, well, because he stole John Wick's car and like killed his dog. Oh, and because of that action, everything else that happens in the film follows on. And the same, I, this is pushing my luck a little bit, but to draw a link between John Wick and Hamlet, what we have is the idea that a character is forced into a pathway of action because they have no other choice. So they step out, in this case, to right a wrong, which then creates a pathway towards death. This being in Hollywood, of course, John Wick will be uh, brutally beaten but never die because there has to be a sequel. In Hamlet, because it's a tragedy, we inevitably involve to a point of death. But the thing that I want to get involved in is this idea that that pathway has this moment that begins everything, and then we're pulled towards an inevitable end. In a health outcome, what we're trying to do is find a pathway that breaks that inevitable link towards death. And here's the changeover, where our two worlds become something different. Like I said, the dramaturg is how you story. So I tell your story. So Hamlet's at uni and Hamlet dies and the space in between is going to be our plot. So can you also see that at any given point in the intervention, action or something else is possible, not better, just different. So here we go. Here are the events, the impossible pathway of distractions, plot and time. We've got death, the ghosts, and all of these interfere in the timeline of Hamlet's life. And every one of these red breaches is an alternative pathway that means that Hamlet doesn't die. So the metaphor that I'm offering you is the idea that each one of these breaches might be an intervention on somebody's life that would create an outcome that is different to the one that the pathway is suggesting that it will follow. Uh, and also the script pre prescribes these events. So the playwright is sculpting and creating this journey to make it thrilling or engaging. But we might imagine, for example, that there are jolts in the life of an individual that would take us from this path that would create something different, something like an external news, uh, I'm pregnant, or I can't pay the bill, or I've been arrested, or some other acti activity connected to the person that we're close to or the person whose story we're following that would change the outcome that would lead them to a different resolution. And all of these things can happen to knock people off their path. And if we want to change the predicted outcome, for example, in a high dependency drug user whose resolution is going to be death, then we might be looking at steps that disrupt that path to create another. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, what we could do and what we could do and when we do it to stop Hamlet from dying are along this pathway. Some of the interventions are positive and some of them are negative. So for example, if Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, doesn't marry Claudius, then the tension that creates the setup for the drama is completely different because whether or not uh, Hamlet Senior, Hamlet's dad, was murdered or not, 
doesn't have the tension of the immediacy of the marriage between his mother and the father, just the villain. Similarly, if Hamlet decides the ghost is in fact the devil, sent to tempt him for his soul and chooses to do nothing, then Hamlet, the individual, has to cope with the pressure of the marriage of his mother and a new father, stepfather, but he also goes through a grieving process for his father that doesn't re result in a revenge. Hamlet tells Ophelia that he loves her and they decide that living in Denmark is too claustrophobic and they need to start a new life in Oklahoma. So all of these things are possible. Hamlet is sent by Claudius to England where he's supposed to die, but he doesn't. If he does, then we're in a different resolution. Again, I'm pointing out that it doesn't necessarily mean better. It's about us finding distractions and disruptions to this path of inevitability of time. Let me show you it in another way. And this is where the storyboarding idea comes for me into a most uh, clear uh, framework. I'm using a one, two, three, four, five, six structure, and you'll see this slide three times with a different context on each. In drama, you insert the disruptions to create the narrative. In the real world, real world, we know the disruptions come, we just don't know what they are and what they might do. We just know that they're coming. But you can plan for them by creating a storyboard structure, in this case through a, a, a pattern of six. The, story, the storyboard shows a pathway that is repeatable and testable. It's pre-planned, monitorable, and expected. In theater, we call it a script. And I guess what I'm suggesting in your research work, in your medical planning, you know that one, two, three, four, five, six is going to happen. You just don't know that three, four, five uh, are going to look like, but you know that they exist. And so part of the idea of storyboarding is creating the blank space where something is going to happen, exist, and planning for that. You can also, my suggestion is, create contexts for three, four, five based on previous experience. And I'll come to that next. So here we go. This time I'm moving into the idea of uh, an individual, let's call them a patient, or an individual who's not yet a patient, but might need to be. So instead of it being the dramatic structure, what we have instead is the idea of a person in an environment with circumstances that do or don't give us concern. And we see symptoms or warnings or triggers and their behavior changes as it does with Hamlet. And it creates action and it creates thoughts, which leads to a crisis, which leads to a climax, which leads to a resolution. The idea is to delay or prevent the next stage so that you can get to six. So we want to avoid crisis or climax. It's also possible looking at previous health journeys of other people to predict where we might go in two, three, four, five, six, and then build ways path pathways to it. What we can also do is recognize that part six is a destination that we do or don't want to get to, and then build uh, proposed pathways back to help us look at what that might look like. Is it possible therefore to look at say point three and know X number of outcomes are possible here? and predict the most likely based on the knowledge from point one. And finally, this is a, a model for researchers and for your the thesis writing, because I appreciate that's different to individual people. So this time we still have the person, the environment, and the introduction, that's you. And then you have your thesis, your expertise, the thing you want to talk about. And then you have your behavior, action, or in this case, context. In part four, instead of using the word crisis, we might use the problem. You identifying the thing that needs to be solved and supporting it with everything you know. In point five, you're going to offer your solution to that. And then at point six, you're going to conclude that. So my idea for this is that regardless of the context, as I said at the beginning, there's a story involved in the way that you unpacked your information. And the unpacking of this information leads to a destination that you predict and therefore remain in control of it. So in theatre, we call it a script. And in this context, we call it an application. To contextualize a little, I'm still using the words crisis and climax because they're dramatic. But in your application, you might find that the circumstances um, uh, been highlighted towards a need for action. So your work has a call for action that is then articulated in four and five. Marvellous. I also want to identify that every individual is different, obviously. And if we go back to the dieter and we know after two weeks their commitment and dedication fade, 
and that cookie is just super tempting, just one cookie. Is there a way that we can introduce language that revolves and removes the guilt about the food dialogue, but in a way that still helps the individual stay on and return to their journey? So the thing that we're trying to do is create a sense of pathway that uh, somebody we're helping can follow and we become their dramaturg, or if we are in the middle of it, we can see our own journey if we're writing and stay true to our path. So this is my um, action plan treatment. This is where six becomes positive. So I've swung it away from the idea of resolution being death as it is in tragedy, but now it's just where we get to. So we start at one and one includes everything that we know about that person. So it could include their socioeconomic status, the place they come from, where they live, the life expectancies of the place in which they live and the universe in which they've grown up and all the circumstances that allow them to be them in this place at this time. And six is a successful conclusion to that journey. I'd like, this is way more complicated. So I've drawn it simply in this format uh, to demonstrate its simplicity, but also allow you the space to imagine that it become massively more complicated. So from one, logically, we step to two. And I've reduced two to three points. So we have two A, two B, two C. But from one, any number of twos are possible. But let's say our person steps from one to two C. Two C then also has a myriad of possibilities towards three. And once they've arrived at three, we can move into the next one. You can also see that I've included an unknown, which is they could have done something completely abstract that I wasn't expecting. And I've included the, the idea of unknownness within this. So three ABC were predictable outcomes from two C. Having arrived at two C, I could see that they might go to three A, three B or three C, but I've also acknowledged that they could go somewhere that I haven't seen. However, we see that they went to three C, which then leads again towards other outcomes and leads to other outcomes, which leads to our resolution. I also want to acknowledge because it's not drama and therefore not a fitted structure. It doesn't have a simple sense of outcome because it's not been crafted by a writer. No resolution is also possible. But what we do want to do is if we see a person at 3C, our intervention might be to steer them to a preferred version of four and having arrived at four, is there a preferred version of five that our intervention can help an individual on a journey towards leading to a destination? And this is my complication moment. This is like a, a, a zooming in on one of these moments, because I think this is also one of the challenges we have to navigate. Because what we have is we start here and we go to progress, but we might not have process. We might just stand still, or even worse, we might have a regression. And if we have progress, that too leads to a progress or a stasis or regression. And a regression might take us back to the beginning and then we get caught in a vicious circle. And so the thing that I want to explore is this idea that I know situation X, previously in circumstance X, X led to Y, but also exposed risks one to three. What story do I need to tell C or follow to help X go to Y and then Z and avoid one, two, three? So to bring your expertise to the conversation, you're also looking at the advancement. How do you get out of this bogged down loop of repeating the same problem and never getting out of it? And if you're writing, how do you get out of your head the challenge of writing round and round and round while you find the perfect way of expressing this brilliant idea you have and move us through to the next step? And the storyboarding is my provocation for you that takes you there. And this is, I think, where we get to the end of it. So we have the world, the other people, the obstacles, the unknown. This is where we started. And what we also have is the context, the information, the ambition, the other people involved. And we have the given circumstances, if you remember that. And then we have the pathway of time and the unknown filled with possible scenarios from the known. So we are taking the information that we know in life and we're moving forward into this universe. And what we're trying to do is get from the given circumstances to a desired outcome. But there are also good outcomes that we didn't see coming or we did see coming that are perfectly acceptable to us. And what we're trying to avoid is unwanted outcomes. So for me, the model is about creating this pathway where we can see steps that we can take, which also have warnings in them. This path leads us towards an unwanted outcome. What do we have to do to change that? 
or this pathway is still leading in the right direction, we're in a good place. How do we get on from that? And so we go to happily ever after. This is my conclusion. I, I wanted to share this picture with you because it has two sides to it. Are you looking at a derelict building with a poster on it that's optimistic, or are you looking at a loft conversion waiting to happen? Ben Zander did this amazing TED talk and has a book called The Art of Possibility that I completely recommended to you. Uh, he has an anecdote in it, uh, which I simplify for this conversation. Two sh shoe salespersons go to place X. One sends a message home. No good, they don't wear shoes. The other sends a message home. Good news, they don't have any shoes. I want you to look at a way of approaching this thing where the idea of hope has purpose. And so my parting suggestion to you is, is your purpose, if your purpose is strong, then you will find a solution and you will find a resilience. Hamlet was a fiction created by Hamlet that has survived, I think, because it explores the fundamentals of what it means to be alive and the battles we all face at difficult and different times in our life to seek that path of curiosity and optimism when opting out is easier. It's an existential struggle. Dramaturgy is a way of adding an analytical layer to your work before, during, and after. It is your critical friend as you're traveling down the pathway, and it helps you plan and expect what might happen next. You can also conceive a template to work that you can manipulate retrospectively to help you uh, see the mistakes or at least the journey that you've taken. And all of this is a tool to help you control and give focus to that which can be extremely complicated. It helps you see the story you want to tell and the audience to hear it too. Thank you. And I'm about to step into uh, answering a question mode. I've seen that there have been loads of chat elements coming in. So I will step away from the presentation and turn back to a face and perhaps there'll be- Stephen, there's been a whole lot of chats and I'm wondering, uh... Amy uh, Dixon, if we could get you to come on as a panelist, and because I, I think what your what your group does and what Stephen's talking about, there's some really interesting interfaces. And I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to get on, uh, so you'd be. Oh, good. So she's, I think Amy said yes. So if Elliot, if you could make Amy Dixon a panelist, and if Amy, if you could come on and kind of describe the, your safe systems work, um, I think, uh, and we could get Stephen's. Uh, take on that, I think that'd be cool. Hi, I missed the last, the last little bit of what you said, John, because I was, it reconnected me, but I think I know. Uh, what I just say what you do and, and get Stephen's response. Okay, hi Stephen, <laughs> thanks, this was great. Um, so I work out in Oregon. Um, I'm the safe systems coordinator for our child fatality prevention and review program. So um, we're doing a lot of work with Dr. Cole and Dr. Lindsay and the National Partnership for Child Safety um, on our critical incident reviews, which are um, child death reviews. So when we receive a report that a child died as a result of abuse, or there's a concern the child died as a result of abuse, um, it if there's some recent history in our, in our, with our department, it triggers a critical incident review. Um, and so those reviews, we really are taking, you know, historically those reviews tend to be really um, negative and punitive towards staff and the organization. Um, and so our work is really around um, thinking about the system story. So, so what is it that happens in the system that influences really common casework problems that come up in, in these cases with tragic outcomes. So we have, you know, really, we're really working on our process to think about in each individual case, what were the points in time in which there may have been an opportunity um, to change the trajectory, right? Um, oh. And so it's really what you're talking about, right? Was there, not, were there points in time in which things could have happened that may have changed the trajectory for the family and for the child? That we're, that we're looking at. But then beyond that, we also look at the system story. So we have improvement opportunities that we identify. And you know, we're actually getting ready to do some work here in Oregon right now, thinking about um, in families with substance use, um, that that was an influencing factor um, in the death of a child and how our um, interventions or understanding of that substance use could have could have changed the outcome, right? So now thinking about across a number of cases, how do we tell the story of the system um, to identify ways in which we might have a different outcome in the future? So um, that's a little bit about our work, but I, I'm wondering, yeah, if, you, what, if that resonates for you and how, how you think about that. 
It, it totally does. And I, I, I have said at the beginning, and I maintain that I do not have uh, health expertise, but it seems to me that one of the things that I've read in papers for years and seems to be part of systems is that we look at these things in retrospect. So we look at what went wrong um, with the intention of learning from it, except we don't learn because when it happens again, we see the same picture returning. And I guess what my provocation is, we know that these things happen and they happen in different ways. And there's detail and nuance in every single moment, but that detail and nuance doesn't stop the fact that uh, we have, in this case, a child in a precarious situation or at-risk at situation from which we know that there are three or four outcomes, including death, uh, including abuse and all the other things that you've mentioned. And my suggestion is you already have that story because another child went through it. And if you can overlay the template of that story rather than look in retrospect, what you're dealing with is the multiple possible outcomes of the next step. Um, because you've seen those steps before. It includes the unknown, the, the curveball, whichever phrase you like, which is something completely radical could happen and completely change the game. That's completely allowed. Um, and you can acknowledge that in it. But my experience just in my own career is that happens really rarely. It's like the lottery ticket outcome, right? But what normally happens is uh, in, in my uh, diagram, A, B or C, we could, we could make that 10 or 15 long, and you could also scale it in terms of um, most likely to happen as number one. The most likely thing to happen is that we do advance to the next step and the next step, and then uh, services get involved and child is removed from home uh, because that starts a new journey for that child, which includes its own dramaturgy. And so my idea is that what you're doing is taking the story of one individual moment, recognizing there are other stories involved in it. So Ophelia has another life in Hamlet, which is complicated enough, including the relationship she has with, with her father and her brother, but that isn't the play of Hamlet. If we were to do the play of Ophelia, we would see her stories going off with different moments and different intersections. And we could again lay a template on her journey that says, how do we stop her dying? And there are multiple ways that we can intervene in that, including solving Hamlet. If we fixed Hamlet, then Ophelia wouldn't die. So part of, I think, the thing that you're talking about is before you start planning in retrospect and then having reviews and so on, is there a way of having a conversation which is, we know that next step in person X is that they will move to A, B or C, probably. And therefore, are we ready for them to arrive in A, B or C? And what do we need to have ready to catch them? This person is falling out of a window. Are we ready to catch them? Or are we going to reflect on what situations we need to happen to stop there being a window in the first place? Which is useless because the person's falling. So for me, it's a case of being proactive, but also dynamic in your system planning because you know that you've been here before. It's just a different name and a different person. And I don't mean that to diminish them. No, you're absolutely right. That's, I, that, yeah, absolutely that. The piece there of are we ready to catch them when they fall right that so it's, there's this retrospective and this prospective right um aspect to it and so really that overlay that you talk about really makes makes a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. yeah and, and the thing is if you know what it is then you already have the resources lined up because you know that they're like they're likely coming down your alley uh it's coming to me or your heads up is it's not coming to me this is likely going to child protection services child protection services. This is all the information you need to receive this person so that they don't have to tell their story again. You've already done that work for them so that they can arrive on a cushion rather than with a hard stop and re-explaining themselves. I don't know about you, this is a non sequitur, but every time I've like had to deal with an organization through telephone tag, this department can't help you. Let me put you through to somebody who can. And then you have to tell your whole story again. And they say, oh, that's, uh, I'm so sorry that you've had that experience. Let me put you through to somebody who can help you. And you do it again and again. How do we um, turn our attention into the protagonist so that their journey through this process is as considerate of their experience as it is useful to us? And I guess that's what I'm doing with this storyboarding. Can I ask just a very concrete, just a clarifying question? So are, are you saying that basically what you would suggest for, for Amy and group is to write the story of kids in child welfare and look for the key points where they go down different pathways, um, yeah. maybe 
pickup point where that kind of highlights those that are at risk of very bad outcomes, or maybe that's all kids start out in child welfare at equal risk of very bad outcomes, or maybe there's a point of inflection like their parents have substance use, or I don't know, I'm making stuff up, but there are yeah. certain characteristics either of the environment or of the of right. the family that are uh, limit the probabilities and then start looking at those points where decisions can be made and design systems that are prepared to shift those decisions at those points of inflection. Absolutely. And theoretically, you can do it for all students, not just the students who are at risk, because my hope, I know this is romantic, but the other thing is that you have an extraordinary student there who should be going to MIT. And what they're doing is identifying a pathway that will allow them be, to be successful within the environment that has limited their life to this point, but still, still show them a pathway towards success, rather than just it being a pathway about avoiding death, for example. Right. So you could do that for permanency planning where you have, you're working with a family and you'd like, they'd like reunification. And so you say, okay, where you are now is here, where you wanna be is there. What are the steps that you need to take to tell your story that you're a happy family together? Yes. But the what are the things that can go wrong that'll lead you into different pathways that you would like to avoid? Yes, sorry, John, I interrupted you. But the point is oh. you're also mapping the other steps that they might take. So you also have a plan for what happens if that path isn't followed. So it's not catching you by surprise if they don't do the happily ever after pathway. And it also doesn't catch you by surprise if they're caught in the loop. Because when you recognize the loop is going on, you need to tell a story that breaks that circuit. Seems so consistent with the safe systems concept of anticipating bad outcomes, right? Bad things. Yep. yep, it really does. And it resonates with our work that we're doing too around when we think about um, neglect and chronic neglect in particular and um, you know interrupting cycles and um, helping families rewrite that story. Mm -hmm. There's a very long comment, Nick. I don't know if you want to read it. It's pretty, it's pretty good. Sure. So let's see. This is from, I can't see exactly who it's from, but Nicole, please. Nicole yes. Uh, it says, this is really, really interesting. I've learned so much from this talk about how to think about designing effective health interventions using a story or using storyboarding framework and also how to tell grant agencies about what researchers are doing and why they matter. I'm a social scientist who works with story in community outreach and engagement. There is a really important question here about what kinds of stories do people need to hear at all those points of crisis? How can you foster powerful storytelling among valuable populations to do both A, better understand the context for researchers, B, provide hope in ways that also avoid the stigmatization uh, you were saying. There is a fantastic set of resources that we use for this work in community and leadership development, story circles, leadership, storytelling, etc. Thank you. That's great. Other uh, comments? I'm wondering, uh, Kate, if, if uh, can we make uh, Kate a presenter? As Kate, uh, Kate Cordell is doing some interesting stuff about uh, st story mapping, which seems like there's some parallel kinds of things. I don't know if you wanted to comment, Kate, not to put you on the spot or anything, but I just put you on the spot. All right, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, thank you. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, no, I, this is, uh, I wasn't being a data person. I wasn't expecting your talk to resonate with me so well. Um, and I really think that you said you're, you're not a, a expert in the social sciences or the health sciences, but boy, you seem to really understand and get uh, the, the circumstances that are being faced in our field. So uh, thank you very much for your um, ability to empathize with with what we face. I appreciate that. 
Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, we're from the data side of things, we now have the capability to use models and we've designed models that can take into account and map these pathways that you're talking about so that we can understand that in this set of circumstances, these are the supports and services that did, um, a, when, when somebody went down a successful pathway, these are the supports and services that were there. And when somebody went down an unsuccessful pathway, these are the supports and services that were missing or the pieces of the story that were different or that did or didn't change. And so we can now use data and statistics with our models to really make those recommendations to say, you know, this is what may lead to a better outcome for this person or this family. So, I mean, it's an exactly in line with what you're saying. We can use data and statistics to overlay those stories um, and look at the pieces that need to change in order to get them on the right trajectory. Great. And it's, the point is it's not proactive in, a, in the sense that you're guessing, you actually know that what it's going to be. It's just implementing so you're not inventing in the moment of crisis. What you're doing is implementing the experience that you already have using the tools that you've already established. That's right. Yeah. And, and we've been collecting data in our field for years and years and years and years. And we have, like you said, a lot of those stories written that just sit unused. If we take that information, and that's part of what John's doing in building the data reservoir and learn from it, we can better serve the people that walk through the door tomorrow because we'll have learned all the different possibilities and ways that stories could have changed or transformed previously and apply that knowledge to the folks coming in tomorrow. So this is, I mean, I think you tell it in such an elegant way, much more elegant than any data scientist could say it. <laughs> so I really appreciate it and want to encourage you to continue to tell our story in ways that uh, folks can understand it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're coming up on our uh, last uh, minute. So I think uh, I wanna just take this moment to thank uh, Stephen and uh, we're gonna continue, I think our work together. So I, there's certainly was a lot of enthusiasm in the chat box of people um, riffing off uh, your comments uh, in ways that are uh, very consistent or helpful in their work. So that's uh, exactly what we uh, aspired to accomplish uh, with our time together. So thank you very much for that. And I think I'm not alone in saying that we could all uh, learn to listen to your voice by itself or all day. I mean, you one of the wonderful pipes with that nice English accent. So it's extremely pleasant regardless of the content, but the content being special, I think is, is useful. And I do think there's this huge opportunity to rethink how we tell our stories in all of our work so that we can be have the dramatic impact that we want actually so without being dramatic right so i think there's there's ways to and the, the missive to always pay attention to your audience and what your audience hears rather than what you say uh, i think is so so critically important so thank you very much i don't know if you have any uh, parting wood, words you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of uh, kudos in the chat room so no, thank you. It's um, been a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. And good luck to everybody on their journeys. And thank you all for coming. And thank you, Amy, for even getting on camera. Appreciate that. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll uh, see you all next time. So uh, the next seminar series is, uh, uh, next seminar will be in April and it's gonna be uh, with Warren Nash from the business school. And the idea is that each faculty member, uh, each practitioner is actually a entrepreneur. And that although we sometimes are not looking to make money, we are looking to accomplish certain outputs and we are often left to our own devices. And so is there something we can learn from entrepreneur science that might help us in our professional development? And so that's the, the st structure of the next uh, IF series seminar. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from Diamond, our creative director, and uh, Nick, our stage director. So I have to just keep it in theater terms. But anyway, so it's a pleasure seeing you all. Good luck to you. Thank you for what you do. And we'll see you next time.